Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, dramatized in two parts by Nick Stafford, with Michael Maloney as Frankenstein and John Wood as the creature. Part one. From John Walton, The Harbour, Archangel, Russia, 28th of March. I have hired a vessel and sailors, men on whom I can depend, possessed of dauntless courage. The captain is a person of excellent disposition, who has been as far north as any human. As we prepare for our heroic undertaking, I try in vain to be persuaded that the North Pole is the seat of frost and desolation. It ever presents itself to my imagination as the region of beauty and delight, where the sun is forever visible. A land surpassing in wonders and beauty every region hitherto discovered on the habitable globe. We shall tread a land never before imprinted by the foot of man. Do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? If I succeed in this enterprise, many, many months, perhaps years, will pass before you and I may meet. If I fail, you will see me soon again. Or never. Cast off for us! Aye, aye, Captain! Cast off! Ah! My voyage commences. July the 31st. We are halted surrounded by ice and have been completely enveloped in fog. Starboard 40! What is it? Starboard 40! A sledge! Where is it? Telescopes for myself on this wall. Through the mist. I can see. Hail it! Oh my God! Telescopes, sir. What is it? It is enormous. What the? Is it a man? There's a man on the sledge. I see him. He doesn't stop. Do my eyes deceive me? Or is he a giant? Assuming the dogs are of normal stature, I should say he is. We are hundreds of miles from land. We are. Can you distinguish his features? No. Could there be land not on the maps? I did not think so, but he must have come from somewhere and be heading somewhere. The fog's closing in again. He's out of sight. How long before the ice breaks and we can move on? Tonight, tomorrow, the day after. Maybe we'll find the North Pole is inhabited by giants. Hey, Mr. Walton. August the 4th. I am in good spirits. My men are bold and apparently firm of purpose. Being icebound did not seem to dismay them. What can stop the determined heart and resolve the will of man? We move now amongst the drifting flows of ice, but slowly... Yes? Captain said I should disturb you, Mr. Walton. What is it? The captain requests you come and see. Mr. Walton, another man on a sledge. Another? I think he's insane. Sir, who are you? My name is Victor Frankenstein. And all I desire is that you should give me a little food. I insist that you come aboard. I cannot. Your ice flow may break up. I shall take my chances. Where have you traveled from? Europe. Europe? Yes. Please, whither are you bound? To the North Pole. And you? You head north? A voyage of discovery. You promised me that you are heading north. Yes. In that case, I will come aboard. But only if my sledge and dog may also be accommodated. For it may be you turn back, whilst I must go on. Surely! Bring them aboard! Bring them aboard! Yeah. 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 
He looks half dead. More dead than alive. Is he saying he's come all the way from Europe over the ice? How is this possible? Um, makes me think of the giant. Take Mr. Frankenstein down to the galley. Rub him with brandy. Feed him. We might have to redraw the maps. <sighs> yes? It is I, Mr. Walton. Walton. Yes, I, I remember. Like your men, you have many questions. It would be impertinent of me. Yet I cannot resist asking, how have you come so far? On the ice. But to what purpose? To seek one who fled me. And does the man you pursued travel in the same fashion? Yes. Four days ago, we saw a man on a sledge. Where? To the south. The demon is just ahead of me. Demon? I must go, please. I... I do not think you're in any condition to resume. Damn, I... He was travelling north? At quite a pace. He had four dogs. Oh, but the ice. He could also have been trapped by its breaking up. Possibly. But at the speed he was travelling, he may have kept ahead of it. At least I must be on deck to keep watch. There is always a lookout posted. They will see anything there is to see. I must know at once. Of course. You are a scientist. Yes. What do you hope to discover at the North Pole? You ask me to reveal my heart. Yes. <laughs> I think I may, in that hitherto unexplored area of the globe, discover the fundamentals of nature and thus acquire dominion over them. <laughs> Unhappy man. Do you share my madness? <laughs> Have you drunk of the intoxicating draught? Hear me! Let me reveal my tale! And you will dash the cup from your lips! Here. Brandy. Why do we do these things? What things? These explorations. You seek for knowledge and wisdom as I once did, and I ardently hope that the gratification of your wishes may not be a serpent to sting you, as mine has been. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have an expression of wildness and even madness, but there are moments when his whole countenance lights up. He must have been a noble creature in his better days. I am by birth a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. <laughs> my mother's tender caresses and my father's smile of benevolent pleasure are my first recollections. With this deep consciousness of what they owed towards the being to which they had given life, it may be imagined I received a lesson of patience. Charity and self-control. <laughs> My mother much desired a daughter, but for a long time I was their only care. When I was about twelve years old, while making an excursion beyond the frontiers of Italy, we passed a week on the shores of Lake Como. My mother's benevolent disposition often made her enter the cottages of the poor. Victor, don't stare. They have hardly any clothing. They are poor. Have you come for her? Come for who? Well, the fair one, Elizabeth. Hmm, obviously not. That's a pity. 
As you can see, she's not ours in the natural way of things. She's golden-haired because her mother, who died in childbirth, was a German, and her father a Milanese nobleman. He gave her to us to nurse. We were better off then. Her father was involved in politics, wresting Italy from Austria. I don't know if he's dead or in a dungeon, but his property has certainly been confiscated. Looks a cherub, doesn't she? She is striking. We sometimes think she was sent by heaven. My mother engaged my father's approval. And the result was that Elizabeth Lavenza came to live with us. I looked upon her as someone to protect, love and cherish my more than sister. Please, do not continue on my account. <sighs> my parents had a second son, Ernest, and then William. Poor, poor William. We moved to Lake Geneva, and, and that's where we grew up, uh, along with my dear friend, Henry Clavard. Victor, Henry, lie on your backs and look at the clouds. And what, Elizabeth, will be revealed to us? You'll see shapes, cities and castles in the air. Very well. <sighs> see that one tinged with grey and mauve? I see a castle with battlements. I see a cloud. The drawbridge is lowered. Knights ride out. A maiden waves a silken handkerchief from the tower. It's King Arthur and Guinevere. Is Arthur gone to seek the Holy Grail? A quest! A quest! Why clouds? What are clouds? I shall stand on this rock and adopt the pose of Guinevere. And I shall be Arthur. You, Victor, you may be Lancelot, Gawain or Galahad. Charles! I should rather be Merlin than capture a cloud, squeeze it until the essence of nature is distilled. Victor? Why? Father? What are you reading? Your Cornelius Agrippa, Father. That's not mine. No? Must have been left by the previous owner. Ah, and Paracelsus. And Albertus Magnus. You have read them? Uh, their work looks sad now. Oh? But Paracelsus, through empirical study, pioneered the treatment of certain diseases. And also stated human beings could be produced without mother and father by alchemical procedures. Pure fantasy. And dangerous to boot. Storm worsens. Albertus Magnus must meet your approval, for he taught Thomas Aquinas. As well as teaching Thomas Aquinas, Albertus Magnus is reputed to have constructed a brazen head that could answer questions. I'm no scientist, but I know none of these gentlemen are considered valid. As you can see, the lightning struck it, eliminating the upper branches, and the trunk, rather than splitting, has been reduced to thin ribbons. <sighs> Tap it. It's not like wood, it's like metal. Mm, the lightning has transformed the wood. In the library, there's a book by Luigi Galvani of Bologna. Now, through his experiments, he deduced that an electricity resides in the nerves and muscles of animals. Is the same true of humans? He only records his experiments with a frog. If he has experimented with humans, he's damned. No, the usefulness of his work is that we know how to improve certain objects by coating them with metal. Galvanism. His other work, I'd be tempted to bracket with the ancients you were reading last night. There's nothing to be gained from attempting to discern the spark of life. Can anything ever be known? We can dissect a frog, name its parts, agitate it with electricity. But we cannot make it live once it is dead. Will the tree grow again? No. 
I think it looks sad now. Sad, Elizabeth? Feel how much like iron it is. When I became 17, my parents determined I should attend the university at Ingolstadt. But before the day of my departure could arrive, Elizabeth caught the scarlet fever. My mother attended Elizabeth's sickbed, and her watchful attentions triumphed over the malignant distemper. Elizabeth was saved. But on the third day, my mother sickened. Her fever accompanied by the most alarming symptoms. On her deathbed, she joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself. There, my dear. My children, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. Mother, don't say why. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father. I should have died. It is not in our gift to decide. Here, Elizabeth, I want you to have my luggage. Keep it. Elizabeth, my love, you must supply my place in the home. <laughs> Take the locket. Fix a fasten it for her. I will endeavor to resign myself cheerfully to death and will indulge her hope of meeting you. In another world. <sighs> Peter, Lyons, and my friend. Really look, chaps, look, careful where you go. No, you no, 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 uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, what do you know? No? Of natural philosophy. The principal authors I've thus far studied are Cornelius Agrippa, Paracelsus, and Albertus Magnus. Who? Oh, uh, Cornelius Agrippa, Paracelsus... Yes, 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 yes. I wasn't asking you to repeat them because I haven't heard of them. I was expressing surprise. Have you really studied these men? Yes. And do you believe in them? I... Their findings are nonsense. Every minute, every instant you have wasted on those books is utterly and entirely lost. You've burdened your memory with exploded systems and useless names. Good God, man! In what desert land have you lived where no one was kind enough to inform you that these... these fancies, which you've so greedily imbibed, are a thousand years old and as musty as they are ancient? Hmm? I, I... I little expected in this enlightened and scientific age to find a disciple of Albertus. Magnus and Paracelsus. I wouldn't describe myself as a disciple. My dear sir, you must begin your studies entirely anew. Here. I shall write a list of books you must procure and read for when I begin lectures next week. Alternate days myself and Professor Valdum on chemistry. Now then. Professor Crampe was a little squat man with a repulsive countenance who did not prepossess me to become his disciple, but Partly from idleness and part curiosity, I went into the lecture room to hear his colleague, Professor Valdem. The modern masters of chemistry promise very little, apart from the knowledge that metals cannot be transmuted and that the elixir of life is a chimera, that is, an idle or wild fancy. But the ancient philosophers whose hands, some profess, seemed only to dabble in dirt, performed miracles. For they penetrated into the recesses of nature to show how she works in her hiding places. They ascended into the heavens. They discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They acquired new and almost unlimited powers, mocking the invisible world with its own shadows. Those were men to whose indefatigable zeal modern philosophers are indebted for most of the foundations of our knowledge.
Professor Valdo. Yes? My name is Victor Frankenstein. Ah, you're the young gentleman who sat open-mouthed. I hope I did not appear to be rude. No, I preferred your response to that of the young man who fell asleep. I cannot imagine anyone falling asleep. Well, the young man behind you did. <laughs> what you said about the ancients. Hmm? I have felt that. I must admit I'm prejudiced against modern chemists. Uh, there are some worth studying, but for their detail, not their philosophy. I should be grateful if you can guide me in advancing my knowledge. Oh, I'm happy to have gained a disciple. Chemistry is that branch of natural philosophy in which the greatest improvements have been and may be made. Come this way. He then took me into his laboratory and explained the use of his various machines, instructing me as to what I should procure. He also gave me a list of books, and I took my leave. Kindly, Professor Valdem. It was a memorable day for me. It decided my future destiny. Two years passed, during which I paid no visits to Geneva, but was engaged heart and soul in the pursuit of discoveries. Whence, I often asked myself, did the principle of life proceed? To examine the causes of life, we must first have recourse to death. I became acquainted with the science of anatomy, but this was not sufficient. I needed also to observe the natural decay and corruption of the human body. Don't stop here, Frankenstein. I need a lantern. You, you want us to be caught here? I can't see what I'm doing. Let me take over. Our friend had a thick head. No, no, you'll damage him. Help me turn him over so I can start from the back. Your essay was remarkable. Thanks to your inspiration. No, no, I cannot claim to be your inspiration. It was your first lecture. The various keys which form the mechanism of my being have been touched. Chord after chord sounds within me. I am not worthy of a disciple. <sighs> Apart from your studies, how is life in Ingolstadt? I have no other life. It shows in your countenance. Two years here, and you have no friends. I have no time for frivolity. A degree of frivolity is entirely necessary, especially for one as youthful... My mind is filled with one thought, one conception, one purpose. So much has been done. More, far more, will I achieve. Treading in the steps already marked, I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers. To what end? The creation of beauty. Can you be more specific? I shall have something to show you soon. My limbs now tremble, and my eyes swim with the remembrance, but a restless and almost frantic impulse urged me forward. Every night I was possessed of a slow fever, and I became nervous to a most painful degree. The fall of a leaf startled me, and I shunned my fellow creatures as if I'd been guilty of a crime. Sometimes I grew alarmed at the wreck I perceived that I had become. The energy of my purpose alone sustained me. Eventually, on a dreary night in November, I beheld the accomplishment of my toil. I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark into the beautiful yet lifeless creature I had created. Damn. Who is this? A message from Professor Valdem, Herr Frankenstein. He invites you to dinner. Go away! Sir? Tell the professor I cannot accept his invitation. Tell the professor I'm almost finished. Yes, sir. More. I have made you, and you shall live. What? His 
his eye opens. His eye opens. Yes. Yes. He lives. He lives. Rise. Rise. Please walk. Come. Walk to me. More light! Oh, ye gods! What have I made? You are meant to be beautiful! But you are foul! Keep away! I relive it now. The beauty of my dream vanished. Breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. I threw myself on my bed, endeavoring to seek a few moments of forgetfulness. I slept, indeed, but I was disturbed by the wildest dreams. I saw Elizabeth in the bloom of health, walking in the streets of Ingolstadt. Why? Elizabeth? Victor! I embraced her, but as I imprinted the first kiss on her lips, they became livid with the hue of death. Oh, oh ye gods! Oh. Elizabeth! Oh. The features appeared to change, and I thought that I held the corpse of my mother in my arms. Oh. No! 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 What was that? Away. Why do you smile at me? Why reach out to me? You think I will take your hand? You think I will embrace you? Oh. Keep away from me! Oh. Away! Oh. I took refuge in the courtyard of the house. Sometimes... My heart beat so quickly I felt the palpitation of every artery. And I feared each sound as if it announced the approach of a demoniacal corpse to which I had given life. At dawn, the gates to the courtyard were opened and I issued into the streets. It began to rain. I dared not look about me. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. Continuing thus, I came at length to an inn, and I, I know not why, paused to study a coach, which approached. Victor! Uh -huh. Henry? Henry, is it you? My dear Victor! How glad I am to see you! <laughs> <laughs> You may easily believe how great was the difficulty to persuade my father that all necessary knowledge was not comprised in the noble art of bookkeeping. Oh. <laughs> but his affection for me at length overcame his dislike of learning, and he has permitted me to undertake a voyage of discovery to the land of knowledge. It gives me the greatest delight to see you, but um, tell me, how, how left you my family? Very well. 
and very happy, only a little uneasy, that they hear from you so seldom. Oh, yeah, but by the by, I mean to lecture you a little upon their account. But, well, my dear Victor, I did not before remark how very ill you appeared, so thin and pale, and look as if you had been watching for several nights. Oh, well, you, you've guessed right. I have lately been so deeply engaged in one occupation that I have not allowed myself sufficient rests. But I, I, I hope, I sincerely hope, that all these employments now are at an end and that I am free. Oh, Friedrich Strasser. Hmm? Uh, Friedrich Strasser, that is your address, is it not? What? Oh, uh, yes. Number 15C. Uh, I thought we might go to a cafe. I should like to deposit my luggage first. Well, here, let, uh, let me... Uh, you, you can't carry them alone. No, please, Henry. Uh, stay here whilst I go up and make my rooms more welcoming. I... I was not expecting visitors, sir. Well, of course. But let me wait at the front door. Experiments have you been performing with this equipment? <laughs> oh, experiments is too fine a description. I've been merely dabbling. <laughs> Even to my untrained eye, it appears too sophisticated to be employed in dabbling. Oh, Henry, you don't know how good it is to see you. Victor, <laughs> what for God's sake is the matter? Do not laugh in that manner. <laughs> I've I'm only fatigued. What I... is the cause of all this? <laughs> hey! Heed? Well, there's no one else here. Who is he? Hey! Oh, Henry! Save me! Save me! Save you from what? From who? <laughs> hey! Hey! <laughs> This was the commencement of a nervous fever which confined me for several months. The form of the monster on whom I had bestowed existence was forever before my eyes, and I raved incessantly. By very slow degrees and with frequent relapses, I recovered. Are you awake? <laughs> Dearest Henry, how kind, how very good you are to me. <laughs> this whole winter, instead of being spent in study as you promised yourself, has, has been consumed in my sick room. How, how shall I ever repay you? You will repay me entirely if you get well as fast as you can. Mm. And since you appear in such good spirits, you will perhaps be glad to see a letter that has been lying here some days for you. It is from Elizabeth. My dear Victor, get, get well, well and, and return, return to, to us. us. You'll find a happy, cheerful home and friends who love you dearly. <laughs> Your father's health is vigorous. And he asks but to see you. Your brothers, Ernest and William, flourish. My trifling occupations take up my time and amuse me, and I'm rewarded for my exertions by seeing none but happy, kind faces around me. Except Justine, our housemaid, has been having a hard time of it. One by one, her brothers and sister died, and now her mother. Justine has returned to us, and I assure you I love her dearly. I wish you could see William. He's very tall of his age, with sweet, laughing blue eyes, 
dark eyelashes and curling hair. Right, dearest Victor. One line, one word will be a blessing to us. Dear, dear Elizabeth. Uh, uh, I will write instantly and relieve them from the anxiety that they must feel. Yes. And when you have done that, I suggest we discuss a walking tour. <sighs> Oh, Henry, this, this has been a glorious fortnight. We have been blessed with the weather. Oh, I realised now I'd become too single-minded. Lost touch with the better feelings of my heart. You haven't revealed about what you were so single-minded. Oh, it matters not now. Once again, I love nature. The cheerful faces of children. Excellent friend. A selfish pursuit had cramped and narrowed me until your gentleness and affection warmed and opened my senses. I have become the same happy creature who a few years ago loved and beloved by all had no sorrow or care. On our return, a letter from my father. My dearest Victor, William is dead. About five in the morning, I discovered my lovely boy stretched on the grass, livid and motionless. I carried him home. It will do no good. It's not there. What? Oh, it isn't there. My darling child, what? the locket his mother gave me. <laughs> Last night he teased me to let him wear it. It's gone. It must be that which urged the murderer to his deed. <laughs> My journey home was very melancholy, and when I drew near my native town, fear overcame me. I dared not advance, dreading a thousand nameless evils. Stop the coach. We're not inside the town gates yet. I don't need you to tell me where I am. I, I shall continue on foot. As you wish. Summits are clear, the sky and lake are blue and placid. Is this to prognosticate peace or mock at my unhappiness? My country, my beloved country. Then, when night fell, I was too late to enter the town, the gates being shut. I resolved to visit the spot where poor William had been murdered. William, this is thy funeral. This is thy dirge. No! No! It cannot be! Can it? No! You are the murderer! Ye gods! Come back, demon! Show yourself! 
Oh, there, among the rocks of Mount Salef, he reaches the summit and disappears. Here to there in a flash of lightning. I made him well, too well. What have I done? Have I turned loose into the world a depraved wretch who is delighted in carnage and misery? What have I done? Welcome, my dear brother, Victor. Oh, sorry. Honest. I, I wish you had come three months ago. Then you would have found us all joyous and delighted. You come to us now to share a misery which nothing can alleviate. Yet your presence will, I hope, revive our father, who seems sinking under his misfortune. And your persuasions will induce poor Elizabeth to cease her vain and tormenting self-accusations. Mm. She most of all requires consolation, having accused herself of the death of our brother. But now the murderer is caught... Or well, how can is... that be? He was free last night. Who, uh, who pursued him? It's quite impossible. One might as well attempt to overtake the winds. I do not know what you mean. But to us, the discovery we have made completes our misery. Who would credit that Justine, who was so amiable and fond of all the family, could suddenly become capable of so frightful, so appalling a crime? Justine? Justine Moritz? Is she the accused? No, no one believes it, surely, Ernest. Several circumstances came out which forced conviction upon us. But she will be tried today, and then you will hear all. It is not Justine. Victor. Oh, Father. Has Ernest told you of Justine? I have, Father. Justine is quite innocent. But that is evident. I know she is not guilty. Then who is guilty? I... Victor? Nothing, Father. If Justine is innocent, God forbid that she should suffer as guilty. The evidence is circumstantial, and I hope, I sincerely hope, that she will be acquitted. They cannot find her guilty on circumstantial evidence. Hello, Victor. Oh, Elizabeth. Let me look upon you. Time has altered you. It has endowed you with loveliness surpassing the beauty of your childish years. Your arrival fills me with hope. You perhaps will, will find some means to justify my poor guiltless Justine. Well, who is safe if she be convicted of crime? She is innocent and that shall be proved. <laughs> Everyone else believes in her guilt. But I know it is impossible. Dry your eyes, Elizabeth. If Justine is innocent, rely on the justice of our courts. Justine Moritz, it is charged that on the... I was walking not far from the spot where the child was found when I saw the accused. I asked her what she did there. But she could only utter unintelligibly. Yes, I do also work at the house. She returned about eight o'clock in the morning. I asked her where she had passed the night, and she replied she'd been looking for the child. Oh, well, when, child. when shown the body, she fell into violent hysterics and kept her bed for several days. And you found the locket? I was going through her clothes in preparation for the laundry. Silence! Silence! Call the defendant, Justine Moritz. I was given permission to spend the evening at the house of an aunt at Shen, a league from Geneva. On my return, at about nine o'clock in the evening, I met a man who asked me if I'd seen anything of the child. I then spent several hours looking for him. Then, finding the gates of Geneva shut, I took refuge in a barn. No, no. Most of the night I spent watching, but towards dawn I slept a little. I was wakened from my sleep because I thought I heard steps. At dawn, I recommenced searching for William. If I passed near the spot where his body lay, it was without my knowledge. Oh, 
I was unable to respond intelligibly to the first witness because I'd not slept and was disturbed by the disappearance of William. Concerning the locket, I can give no account. I am only left to conjecture. I beg permission to have character witnesses, and if their testimony will not overweigh my supposed guilt, I must be condemned. Although I would pledge my salvation on my innocence. Call Elizabeth Lavenza. I am well acquainted with the accused. I have lived with her in the same house. For my own part, I do not hesitate to say that, notwithstanding all the evidence produced against her, I believe and rely upon her perfect innocence. Oh, what about that? As to the bauble the case rests upon, if she had desired it, I should have willingly given it to her. So much do I esteem and value her. Why speak well of her? She murdered your brother! She's innocent! She did not do it! Having passed a night of unmingled wretchedness, the next morning I went to the court for the verdict. You are Victor Frankenstein, are you not? I am. She confessed in the night. Confessed? Justine Moritz is condemned. Her confession was hardly necessary, but none of our judges likes to condemn on circumstantial evidence alone. I hope you and your family find some peace now. Yes? A message from the jail, sir. Justine Moritz humbly requests a visit from Mistress Elizabeth. Thank you. No reply. You can't go. I do not know what to do. It's Justine. Well... I leave it to your judgment and feelings. Thank God your mother isn't alive to witness this. Victor, would you accompany me? I? I cannot go alone. Thank you. Thank you both for coming. Oh, Justine. Why did you rob me of my last consolation? I relied on your innocence. And although I was then very wretched, I was not so miserable as I am now. And do you believe that I am so very, very wicked? Do you also join with my enemies to crush me? To condemn me as a murderer? I am not one of your enemies. I believed you guiltless until I heard you yourself had declared your guilt. I confessed a lie. I confessed that I might obtain absolution. Ever since I was condemned, my confessor has besieged me. Your priest? He threatened and menaced until I almost began to think I was the monster he said I was. He threatened hellfire and excommunication in my last moments if I continued to deny. What could I do? In an evil hour, I subscribe to a lie. I will proclaim I, I will prove your innocence. You shall not die. I do not fear to die. That pang is past. They would have found me guilty without my confession. Dear sir, you are very kind to visit me. You, I hope, do not believe I am guilty. Oh, no. Uh, no, uh, absolutely not. No, Justine. He is more convinced of your innocence than I was. I truly thank you. <laughs> I wish that I were to die with you. I cannot live in this world of misery. Farewell, sweet lady. May heaven in its bounty bless and preserve you. May this be the last misfortune that you ever will suffer. And on the morrow, Justine died. You did not speak then. What could I say? Mr. Walton, what would you have said? I know not. Please. I do not accuse. I do not mean to torture you any more than... I cannot be tortured any more than I am. 
then I, I thought I had reached my limit if I had but guessed. Gods. Ye gods. Elizabeth? Elizabeth? Here. Why do you sit in the dark? It suits my mood. When I reflect on the miserable death of Justine Moritz, I, I no longer see the world and its works as they before appeared to me. Please, I feel no. as if I were walking on the edge of a precipice, towards which thousands are crowding and endeavouring to plunge into the abyss. Father needs William to... and Justine were assassinated, and the murderer walks free. We retired to our house at Belle Reve. I have been the author of unutterable evils. The monster I have created will perpetrate more wickedness as long as anyone I love remains. I shall live in fear. I should plunge into this silent lake that the waters might close over me and my calamities forever. <gasps> but who's that? <sighs> my mind must clear my mind. Trees lie broken. Mists rise from the rivers. Stones roll down glaciers. Come on! Ignorant beast! You... Come on! Forward! I shall leave you here then. Me, mule. See me traverse the ice. Wandering spirits, allow me this faint happiness, or take me as your companion away from the joys of life. What? Where? The wreck! Frankenstein! Wretch! Demon! Dare you approach me? <laughs> oh, that I could, with the extinction of your life, restore those victims you have so diabolically murdered! I shall speak and you shall listen! I shall not! You must! You, my creator, detest and spurn me, thy creature. You want to kill me? You who made me? How dare you sport us with life? Murdering monster! Fiend that thou art! The torches of hell are too mild a vengeance for thy crimes. You reproach me with your creation. Come on, then! that I may extinguish the spark I so negligently bestowed! Remember, thou hast made me more powerful than thyself. But I will not be tempted to set myself in opposition to thee. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. I was benevolent and good, but misery made me a fiend. Make me happy, and I shall again be virtuous. Leave my son. Do your duty towards me. And I shall do mine towards you. 
than the rest of mankind. If you will comply with my conditions, conditions, I will leave you at peace. But if you refuse, I will let the law of death until it be sated with the blood of your remaining friends. Cursed be these hands that formed you! In Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, dramatised by Nick Stafford. Frankenstein was played by Michael Maloney, The Creature by John Wood, and Walton by Philip Joseph. Elizabeth was played by Janice Chambers, Clerval by Paul Panting, Alphonse by Ted Richards, and the captain was Neville Jason. Caroline was played by Francis Jeter, Justine by Deborah Berlin, Kremper by Don McCorkindale, and Valdem by Malcolm Ward. Other parts were played by Peter Kenny, David Jarvis, and Margaret John, and the director was Claire Grove. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, dramatized in two parts by Nick Stafford. Part two. Frankenstein has been brought on board a ship bound for the North Pole. The creature he created has murdered his brother and a young woman has hung for the crime while Frankenstein remains silent. He tracks the creature to the mountains. See, I lit a fire for you. See? Warm yourself. Now, listen. Yes. It is with considerable difficulty that I remember the original era of my being. And it was a long time before I learned to distinguish between the operations of my senses. In the forest near Ingolstadt, I lay by the side of a brook until tormented by hunger and thirst. I learnt to slake my thirst from the brook and ate some berries that were lying on the ground. Before I had quitted your apartment, I had covered myself with some clothes. But these did not fit. I was a poor, helpless, miserable wretch. I knew nothing. Soon, a gentle light stole over the heavens and gave me a sensation of pleasure. I struck off through the wood toward the rising sun, at length discovering open country. In the distance, I perceived a small hut, a sight new to me. This flight somewhat surprised me, but I was enchanted by the hut, dry and warm, and I greedily devoured the remnants of the man's breakfast. From there I proceeded across the fields for several hours until, at sunset, I arrived at a village. How miraculous did this appear? The huts, the neater cottages, and stately houses engaged my admiration by turns. I entered one of the cottages. Oh, <laughs> 
What's happening? I ran for an age until I came across an isolated cottage with an adjoining hovel wherein I took refuge from the inclemency of the season and still more from the barbarity of man. Fixing my eye to a crack in the door, I spied a small girl meanly dressed in a coarse blue petticoat. Her fair hair was plaited. Agatha? I'm going for milk, Felix. Don't be long. The young man entered the cottage and turning in my hovel, I found another crack through which I could spy the interior. Agatha has gone for milk, Grandfather. Yes, I know. I'm going for wood. When the girl returned with the milk, she sat down by the old man and he, taking up an instrument, began to play. He played a sweet, mournful air, which drew tears from the girl. I felt sensations of a peculiar and overpowering nature, a mixture of pain and pleasure, such as I had never before experienced. Soon after this, the young man returned with some wood, and taking up what I now know to be a book, read aloud. O oh, spirit, that does prefer before all temples the upright heart After the many pure, nights witnessing this, I perceived knows, these people possessed a method of communicating their experience and feelings like to one another by sounds, what I now know to be words. What in me is dark? This was indeed a godlike science, and I ardently desired to become acquainted with it. For many months I listened and learned until I felt capable of approaching these gentle people myself, capable of speech. However, one night when I was foraging for food, I bent down over a pool of water to drink. And when the moon came out from behind a cloud, I twisted, thinking something fiendish behind me. There was nothing. Again I looked behind me, not comprehending what I saw in the pool. The first word I uttered. The first time I realized I was a monster. What was I? Why was I different from all the people I had seen? I had no idea until I was able to decipher these papers. My channel. A cursed creator. Why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turned from me in disgust? Still, there was one man who might not turn from me. The old man next door was blind. Come in. Pardon this intrusion. I am a traveller in want of a little rest. Enter. Unfortunately, my children are not home. And as I am blind, I am afraid I shall find it difficult to procure food for you. Oh, do not trouble yourself, my kind host. I have food. It is warmth and rest only that I need. Where do you travel? I am going to claim the protection of some friends whom I sincerely love, and of whose favour I have some hopes. 
I wish you luck. These amiable people to whom I go have never seen me, and know little of me. I am full of fears, for if I fail, there I am an outcast in the world forever. Oh, to be friendless is indeed to be unfortunate, but the hearts of men, when unprejudiced by any obvious self-interest, are full of charity. They are kind. But where they ought to see a feeling and kind friend, they may behold only a detestable monster. Well, where do your friends reside? Near this spot. I cannot judge your countenance, but there is something in your words which persuades me that you are sincere. From your lips first have I heard the voice of kindness directed towards me. <laughs> oh, come now. Have my grandchildren return. You and your family are the friends of whom I speak. Great God, who are you? <laughs> Leave him! I beg you, I... Oh. Felix! <laughs> <laughs> That branch! The monster broke it as if it were a twig! Monster? Cursed, cursed creator! Why did I leave? Why in that instant did I not extinguish the spark of existence which you had so wantonly bestowed? No! Ah! <laughs> Be frightened, I shall not harm you. When night came, I wandered in a wood, no longer restrained by the fear of discovery. <laughs> I bear a hell in reach. Listen, listen, mankind. I declare everlasting war against your species. And most of all, against him who formed me and sent me forth to this insupportable misery. Frankenstein, Frankenstein, I will spread havoc. I learned from the papers in my pocket that Geneva was your native town, and towards this place I resolved to proceed. I felt emotions of gentleness and pleasure revive within me. <laughs> I'm coming to find you! She ran close to the river. Where are you? <laughs> The girl is here. Who's that? Over here. <gasps> she fell in the river. Get away from her! I saved her from the river. <laughs> I had saved a human being, and my reward was to writhe under the pain of a wound which shattered flesh and bone. After some weeks, my wound healed, and I continued my journey. It was evening when I arrived at Geneva, and I retired to a hiding place in a thicket in the field, slept, and was awoken by the approach of another child. A beautiful child. An idea seized me. 
that this little creature might be unprejudiced and had lived too short a time to revive the horror of deformity. If I could educate him as my friend, I should not be so desolate. I do not intend to hurt you. Monster! Ugly wretch! Let me go! You wish to eat me or tear me to pieces! Listen to me. Put me down or I will tell my papa. You must come with me. Hideous monster! My father will punish you! He is powerful. He is Monsieur Frankenstein. Uh, Frankenstein? Yes, Frankenstein. See, the name frightens you. Tell me, has your father lived in Ingolstadt? No, that is my elder brother, Victor. He will punish you as <laughs> William? William is dead. And the locket. Locket? Around his neck. Oh, that. You took it from his neck and secreted it with Justine, thus incriminating. Justine? Was that her name? Yes, Justine, our beloved adopted sister. <laughs> I did not know her name or her origins. You did not. She did hang for it. Yes. <laughs> Two of your family. <coughs> Two of my family, if truth be told. Your family? Well, if I have a name, it can only be Frankenstein. You are my father. <laughs> the locket, it contained the portrait of a most lovely benign woman. Another Frankenstein? My mother. She would not have looked so benignly upon me. Or you, had she known what you have done. Oh. Leaving the body of William, I took the locket, entered a barn which appeared to be empty. But a young woman slept there. Named Justine, it would seem. Not so beautiful as your mother, but smiling in her sleep. Here. I thought, is one of those joy-imparting smiles bestowed on all but me. I bent over her sleeping form. Awake, fairest, thy lover is near. He who would give his life but to obtain one look of affection from thy eyes. Oh, my beloved, awake. A fiendish thought stirred within me. She shall suffer. I murdered because I am forever robbed of all that she could give me. She shall atone. I bent over and slipped the locket into a pocket of her dress. I held my breath. Then fled. I am alone and miserable. Man will not associate with me. But one as deformed as myself would not totally deny herself to me. You must create for me a female. I refuse. Shall I create another like yourself whose joint wickedness might desolate the world? If any being felt emotions of benevolence towards me, I should return them a hundredfold. <sighs> what I ask of you is reasonable. A creature of another sex, but as hideous as myself. Oh, oh my creator, make me happy. Mr. Walton. Yes? Do I disgust you? No. No. Please proceed. The creature moved me. I felt there was some justice in his argument. Yes. Yes. 
I think that was. His tale and uh, the feelings he expressed proved him to be a creature of fine sensations, and... <laughs> Did not I, as his maker, owe him the portion of happiness that it was in my power to bestow? If you consent, neither you nor any other human being shall see us again. We will go to the vast wilds of South America. We shall make our bed of dried leaves. The sun shall shine on us as on man. I see some compassion in your eyes. How could you, who long for the love and sympathy of man, persevere in this exile? You will return and again seek our kindness, and again you will meet with our detestation. Again your evil passions will be renewed, and you will have a companion to aid you in destruction. I cannot consent. I swear to you, by you that made me, that with the companion you bestow, I will quit the neighborhood of man. <laughs> my life will flow quietly away, and in my dying moments I will not curse my maker. No. No. <sighs> Mr. Walton, I felt a need to console him. But when I looked upon him, when I saw the filthy mass that moved and talked, my heart sickened. I cannot <sighs> truly imagine how he might appear. I had meant him to be beautiful. My vices are the children of a forced solitude that I abhor, and my virtues will arise when I live in communion with an equal. Very well, I consent to your demand. Oh, On the solemn oath to quit Europe forever, and every other place in the neighborhood of man. I swear by the sun, and by the blue sky of heaven, and by the fire of love that burns in my heart, that if you grant my prayer, you will never behold me again. If I remember, I shall watch your progress with unutterable anxiety, and fear not but that when she is ready, I shall appear again. <laughs> oh, stars and clouds and winds, crush sensation and memory. Let me become as no. I'm happy to remark, my dear Victor, that you seem to be returning to yourself. It is true, Father. I do feel a little better. Yet you are still unhappy, and you still sometimes avoid our society. Oh, uh... I have conjectured on this, and an idea has struck me which I must put to you concerning the source of your present state. Uh oh? Do I alarm you? Uh, no. What is your idea? I confess I've always looked forward to your marriage with Elizabeth as the stay of my declining years. But now I wonder if you perhaps regard her as your sister without any wish that she may become your wife. Oh. Well, you may have met with another whom you love, and considering yourself bound in honour to Elizabeth, this struggle may occasion the poignant misery which you appear to feel. No, father, be assured I love Elizabeth dearly. <laughs> there is no other. Ah, can I ask you... Do you object to an immediate marriage? Uh, I, I, I have no objection, save a desire to visit England. Uh, England? In order our marriage to commence with no hindrances, that I should be restored entirely, I, I should make such a journey. Ah. Elizabeth! It is settled. Father? Victor will journey to England, and on his return, you shall be married. Do you sincerely wish that, Victor? Elizabeth, I, I'm sorry for having been so distracted. Our union is my sincerest desire. I only make this journey that I may be fully restored. And Henry, why not ask him to accompany you? Huh? Then we shall know you are safe. <laughs> You, you shall write to Henry. Ask him to meet you in Strasbourg, from whence you may sail down the Rhine. And whilst you're away, Elizabeth and myself shall make preparations. Please, Victor, hasten your return. <laughs>
Friends tell me that we should stay a day at Mannheim and Mainz, and that after Mainz, the river descends rapidly between steep hills of beautiful form, and there are many ruined castles and black woods, and it's the time of the vintage. Oh, this is what it is to live! But, Victor, why are you so sorrowful? Oh, uh, beloved friend. It was a clear morning in the latter days of December that I first saw the white cliffs of England. So, Herr Claval, you wish to learn the Indian languages? Mm. Yes, Mr. Hubbard. You see, I am sure that if I do, I shall be able to assist the progress of European colonization and trade. Ah. I know someone who may be able to help you. Indeed. I shall introduce you to him. And uh, you, Herr Frankenstein? I'm interested in anatomy, Mr. Hubbard. Really? Anatomy displeases you? It does not displease me, but I must admit, this preoccupation with the interior workings of the human body chills me a little. What's inside should stay inside, to my mind. Oh, but by knowing anatomy, we may learn how to preserve <clears throat> life. Well, we're all going to die, and it's not for us to say how or when. We ought to preserve life beyond that which has been decided. I associate anatomy with grave robbing. Wrong of me, perhaps, but there you are. However, each to his own. I have the acquaintance of a fellow of the Royal College. Now, the brain being exposed, uh, could you revolve the cadaver so everyone can see? Yes. As you can all see, the brain itself is of a grey colour, with thin pink veins running through. Has everyone seen it in place? Yes. yes. Good. Now, oh. anyone is uh, free to leave the theatre. Uh, would uh, someone be so kind as to remove and resuscitate him? Yes. Thank you. Now, one of my assistants will place the brain in a dish and carry it around for closer inspection. <laughs> Professor Beaumont. Uh, yes? I am a friend of Mr. Habert, Victor Frankenstein. Ah, oh, yes. Habert mentioned you. A fine dissection and lecture. Thank you. I studied at Ingolstadt under the tutelage of Professor Waldem. Yes, yes, I, I have heard of him. Uh, if there's any way I can be of assistance during your stay in England... Uh... Uh, yes, there is. I mean to conduct some research for my own amusement <laughs> more than any real purpose. I have my instruments with me, but of course... No material to work on. Yes, I see. I will pay you... Uh, I... Would you care to accompany me to my study? It's quieter there. I fixed on the remotest of the Orkneys, hardly more than a rock whose high sides were continually beaten upon by the waves. It was a filthy process in which I was engaged. Three years before I was intent upon creating beauty and had created a fiend whose unparalleled barbarity had desolated my heart. Who's there? Frankenstein, you are nearly finished. A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips as he gazed on me. Oh, bounteous creator, I fall on my knees before you as a grateful son to a benevolent father. See how beautiful she will be. I shall love her, and she shall love me, and we shall be happy. I thought of how his happiness could be the end of mankind. Sickened, I took hold of his as yet lifeless mate. <laughs> Oh! <gasps>
Oh, no, no. I did not mean to strike you. Put her back together, please. I love her. Please. You have destroyed her. Be gone. You break your promise. I will never create a You destroy like my hopes. You had sworn to quit the neighborhood of man, but she had not. She, she might have hated you. She, she, she might have turned uh, to the superior beauty of man. You would then have been again alone. I... She would not. You think she was beautiful. I should kill you. Oh. No, you would be absolved from your conscience. Rebuild her, or I shall make you so wretched the light of day will be hateful to you. Your threats cannot move me to do this act of wickedness. Shall each man find a wife for his bosom, each beast a mate, and I be alone? Are you to be happy whilst I grovel in the intensity of my wretchedness? Henceforth, dearer to me than light or food is revenge. You, my tyrant and tormentor, shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery. Devil cease! Do not poison the air with this malice. You deny me the right to happiness. I shall be with you on your wedding night. <laughs> That then is the period fixed for the fulfillment of my destiny. In that hour, I shall die. The remains of the female creature lay scattered on the floor. I almost felt as if I had mangled the flesh of a human being. I placed it all in a basket with a quantity of stones. A small fort, you say? Just for this evening. It's ten o'clock. Late to go for a sail. I'll pay. The tricky waters. You know how to sail. I grew up by Lake Geneva. Ah, uh, well, this is the Atlantic. Can you procure me a boat or not? I think I can get you a skiff. Soon enough, but you'll not be consulted as to your quarters, I promise you. Why do you answer so roughly? Surely it is not the custom of Scotsmen to receive strangers so inhospitably. I don't know what the custom of the Scots may be, but it is the custom of the Irish to hate villains. Villains? You must follow me to Mr. Kerwin's to give an account of yourself. Who is Mr. Kerwin? A magistrate. I just walk. We'll follow. <laughs> What is your name? Frankenstein. Victor Frankenstein. And where do you hail from, Mr. Frankenstein? Geneva, Switzerland. You didn't sail from there. Uh, I have been in the Scottish Orkneys. A storm blew me. Who appears as witnesses? Joseph O'Connor, let us hear your deposition. Uh, uh, your Honor, sir. <clears throat> Last night, I was out fishing with my son, Seamus, and my son-in-law, Daniel Nugent, when, about ten o'clock, we observed a strong northerly rising, so we put in for port. It was very dark, as the moon had not yet risen. We landed at the creek about two miles down the coast. 
I walked ahead, carrying tackle, while the other two followed the catch. In the dark, I tripped over something and fell to the sand. It was the body of a man. We first thought it was a poor wretch who'd been drowned and cast ashore there, but on examination we found the body to be dry and warm. We carried him to the nearest cottage, old Mrs. Flaherty's, where we endeavoured to revive him. He was a handsome young man. There were finger marks around his neck. See, the stranger trembles. <laughs> Silence. Silence. Thank you, Joseph. Seamus O'Connor, is that a true account of the events? It is, sir. Have you anything to add? No, sir. But the third member of our party, Daniel Nugent, has. Daniel Nugent, step forward. <laughs> uh, sir. Uh, just before Joseph fell over the body, despite there being no moon, I swear that by the light of the stars I saw a boat, a single man in it, a short distance from the shore. Sir, the boat strikes me as being the same as this stranger arrived in. And I saw him. Who's that? Mary Morrissey, Your Honour. All right, step forward. I live near that beach and was standing at the door of my cottage about the time when I saw a boat, like the strangers, push off from the spot near where the body was found. Yeah, look, no, <laughs> there's sweat pouring from the stranger. Yeah, oh, yes, oh, All right, 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 right. Oh, okay. All right, then, lead the way, lead the way. Now, Mr. Frankenstein, I shall enter first, then you follow. All right, come in, please. You ready? Yes. Then I shall remove the sheet. Oh. Henry. What did he say? Henry. He said Henry. Oh. Oh. He's thrown himself in the glass. Of my murderous machinations oh, deprived you all's whole life. Is this gentle being lost forever? Take him away. My friend. Get him off the corpse. Henry! Ah, oh, that's enough of that. That's enough of that. Get him off. I murdered William. I murdered Justine. I murdered Henry. It's babbling again. Does it all the time? Please, please, help me destroy the feet. He has his fingers around my neck. Please. He says someone has their fingers around his neck. Please. Back with us, Mr. Frankenstein? Yes. I fear that this place is very shocking to you. On the whole earth, there is no comfort I am capable of receiving. I know that the sympathy of a stranger can be but of little relief to one borne down as you are by so strange a misfortune. But you will, I hope, soon quit this melancholy abode, for I believe evidence will be forthcoming to free you from the charges. Mm -hmm. I think you were thrown by some accident on this shore, seized immediately and charged with murder shown your friend whose body had been placed across your path. How do you know this? In the two months since your arrival, I have conducted an investigation. It seems you were in the Orkneys at the time of the murder. Obviously, you knew the victim, and I can only surmise the rest in order to make some sense of it. I do not believe it was an accident. Some fiend sought to harm you. Now, have you any idea as to his identity? I cannot think who might devise and be capable of committing such an act. And all right. However, there is someone to see you. You carried some papers, letters. I wrote to your father. My father? He waits outside. Here? Yes? I shall send him in to you. <sighs> Victor? Father? Oh, my son! Oh. 
Victor. I know you feel deeply the death of Henry, but I think there is something else. Justine, poor unhappy Justine, was as innocent as I, yet she died for it, and I'm the cause I murdered her. Victor. William, Justine, Henry, all by my hand. What's the explanation of these oh, I you would think me mad. Victor, you are my son. I wish it were not so. I wish I had no loved ones. I implore you never to make such an assertion again. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, I am not mad. The sun and the heavens can bear witness to my truth, but I am the assassin of those innocents. They died by my machinations. How is he? See for yourself. Victor? I'm home. Victor? Oh, Victor! We have sat here for hours and you have neither spoken nor moved. I'm happy to be home. You are thin, Victor. And still a little feverish. You are also thinner. There is something gone from you, Victor. A, a spark. So much has happened. Too many miseries. Are we to live the rest of our lives like this? You are my only chance of happiness. Yet I have one secret. A dreadful one. What? A secret which, when revealed to you the day after our marriage, will have you wondering that I survive what I have endured. Is that a proposal? A clumsy one. Yes. I will marry you. I shall be with you on your wedding night. Senor Frankenstein and your wife, we received your reservation. The bridal suite is prepared. Thank you. The musicians, they are Austrians on a tour. They come every year. I'll have someone show you up. Will you take dinner in your suite? Shall we? Oh, yes. This way, please. Victor, why have you taken to carrying a pistol? From experience, I believe it may be necessary. Nothing will harm us here. Let me be the judge of that. Why so agitated? What is it you fear? Uh, I shall take a turn before settling. Shall I accompany you? No, I, I mean no. Uh, How long shall you be gone? I do love you, Elizabeth. want you to see me die. My apologies. What? 
Steady now, the hand that made me. <gasps> now I shall leave you with your bride. <laughs> <laughs> Signor Frankenstein. It should have been me. Oh my God. Who did this? A demon leapt through oh. the window. Arm yourselves! Quick! He'll be broken on the ground underneath. He will not. But it is 50 feet to the ground. Uh, uh, Where are you going? I have to see my father. I, I will pay whatever it takes. Father! Father! There! Father, you are safe! What are you talking about? Where is Elizabeth? Victor? Where is Elizabeth? Father, Elizabeth is murdered. My heart will break! No! No, 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 no! And break it did. He died in my arms. <laughs> and what became of me? <laughs> Chains and darkness <laughs> pressed upon me. Indeed, I was called mad, and for many months a solitary cell was my habitation. On release, I opted for revenge. I found myself at the cemetery where William Elizabeth and my father lay. They are dead and I live. Their murderer also lives. By the sacred earth on which I kneel, I swear. And by thee, O oh night, and the spirits that preside over thee to pursue the demon until he or I shall perish in mortal combat. Let the cursed and hellish monster drink deep of agony. Frankenstein, <gasps> come then pursue me. At last you desire me. <laughs> Now I flee and you follow. The tables are turned. I can tell them over here. Where? Come over here. Uh, stay. Damn you. We are both damned. I pursued him, and for many months this has been my task. Amidst the wilds of Tartary and Russia I have ever followed his track. Cold, want and fatigue were the least pains I was destined to endure, carrying within me my internal hell. Sometimes, when overcome by hunger, a repast was prepared for me in the desert. You think he left it for you? Yes. And sometimes he left marks on trees. Messages. My reign is not yet over. You live and my power is complete. Follow me, my creator. Find just ahead of you a dead hare. Eat and be refreshed. Come on, my enemy. Your toils only begin. Wrap yourself in furs and provide food, for we shall soon enter upon a journey where your sufferings will satisfy my everlasting hatred. Oh. 
I pull the point to heaven to support me! cracked. I was adrift. One by one my dogs died and were eaten. I was about to expire when I saw your vessel. Who is it? Forgive my intrusion, but you mustn't. Despite expectations, the ice is closing in again. The crew grow restless. No. I think we should turn back. No. At least consider it before the ice closes completely and we have no choice. <coughs> Thank you, Captain. I'll come up. Sir. When younger... I believe myself destined for some great enterprise. But all my speculations and hopes are nothing. I trod heaven in my thoughts. But how I am sung. And my task is unfulfilled. Please. After I die, if he appear, swear that he shall not live. Thrust your sword into his heart. I will hover near and direct the steel aright. I shall do it. I have... know you have been writing this down. Tell it truly. Please. How did you make the creature? September the 15th. I go up on deck to collect my thoughts. Privately, I have decided to acquiesce to the crew and captain. I have lost my friend and all my hopes of utility and glory. Mr. Walton, see the ice forward. And it truly closes in aft. As you may see for yourself. Hmm. Frankenstein is dead. What's that? What's what? I heard something. The wind. I am sorry over Frankenstein. No man could have survived what he has endured. Are there lookouts posted? The usual one. I think we need more. To spy what? I do not know. Then what shall I tell them to seek? Anything. Is there something I should know? Am I master of this ship? Yes, Mr. Walton. Bosun, post lookouts to both sides, forward and aft. Aye, aye, sir. And the ice? Turn the ship around. Helmsman, starboard, 180 degrees. Aye, aye, sir. Yeah. Yeah. The North Pole will have to wait. Is the demon here? <laughs> demon! Man, do not harm me. I will not harm you if you do not harm me. I could tear you limb from limb before you ran me through, even before you could cry out. <gasps> See? I am here to weep and mourn. And if you make a movement or a noise, I shall kill you. Understand? Yes. He told you of me? 
the whole story. He called me demon. Amongst other things. And do you feel no pity for me? No, you abhor me. But not as I abhor myself. I shall quit your vessel and seek the most northern extremity of the globe. I shall die. I shall no longer feel the agonies which now consume me. Death is my only consolation. Oh, Father, once I falsely hoped to meet with beings who would love me. I was nourished with high hopes. But now crime has degraded me beneath the meanest animal. No guilt, no misery can be found equal to mine. I have murdered the lovely and the helpless. I have strangled the innocent. I shall build a funeral pyre and exult in the agony of the flames. The light of the conflagration shall fade away. The ashes shall be swept into the sea by the wind, and my spirit will sleep in peace. For if it survives, it will not surely survive that. Farewell, Frankenstein. Farewell, my creator. In Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, dramatised by Nick Stafford. Frankenstein was played by Michael Maloney, The Creature by John Wood, and Walton by Philip Joseph. Elizabeth was played by Janice Chambers, Clerval by Paul Panting, Alphonse by Ted Richards, and William by Sam Crane. De Lacey was played by Gavin Muir, Agatha by Deborah Berlin, Felix by Peter Kenny, and Habert by Malcolm Ward. Kerwin was played by James Berwick, The Nurse by Annie Tobin, O'Connor by Peter Caffrey, Nugent by James Telfer, and The Captain by Neville Jason. The director was Claire Grove. <laughs>